name is Carrie Keene. Yes, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Kerry King. I'm a research scientist and assistant director at the Energy Institute at the University of Texas at Austin. And today I'm going to talk about some economic growth modeling work that I've been doing. Uh, it's what I call the Harmony model that I'll describe. And um, on, the, on the first slide here, I give a little bit of the motivations for some of my research. My background is actually as an engineer, so a physical sciences background. Uh, but uh, the last 10 years I've been studying economics and beginning in, in macroeconomics, and I've been looking to blend the ideas of uh, physical science modeling, uh, system dynamics, and macroeconomics. So a lot of the motivation for this research is to have what I, improved macroeconomic th theoretical frameworks that can have real dynamics like time uh, integration into modeling and blend both physical concepts, physical variables like population and mass uh, and energy uh, with monetary variables or uh, variables that are in, of interest to economists. And this includes debt, so that we can understand things like the financial crisis and the role of money in, the, in a modern economy uh, as we have today. Uh, and some of this motivation also stems from, say, the financial crisis of 2008. Um, was it a, a debt-induced bubble? Certainly there was speculation uh, in these kinds of things across mortgages in the United States. Um, but there was also a lot of pressure on commodities from China uh, booming, and there was a lot of pressure on commodities in general, energy uh, being one of these. Uh, and so energy prices were going up. And so there's debate, you know, was it a purely debt induced bubble uh, and speculation? There's obviously a, a component of that. And was it uh, a pressure on natural resources as well? And I think there was a component of that as well. But really, the question was, can you tell how much is from one pressure versus another, uh, how can you tell the difference? Do we have models that can actually help us understand this question? So this is the motivation for some of the research. So today I'm gonna briefly describe what I call the Harmony model, which is human and resources with money model. I, the name is a blend from some other papers that I have combined uh, into, uh, ideas that I've combined into this single model. Uh, version 1.0 was published last year in Ecological Economics, and I've just submitted uh, version 1.1 of the model with some slight changes, uh, and I'll show results from that, and that's been uh, submitted for review now. So what is the basic concept? The basic concept is to blend what we, I would call biophysical models that have population, natural resources, capital as a physical quantity, like machines as a physical uh, uh, concept, like a power plant, for example, uh, with economic models that also might describe population capital usually as a monetary quantification, wages, employment, and, and sometimes debt. So the idea is, okay, the Harmony model said, how can we combine these ideas in the most basic way to then explore feedbacks between the physical environment and economic outcomes? So this slide will show you a little bit of how the model is constructed in a flow diagram. And again, this is kind of a, a toy model at this point. It's not specific to any country. It's not calibrated to anything. It's just the basic components of how you would blend these ideas together. So it starts with there is a natural resource. In this case, it is modeled like a forest here. So I show a tree, um, which is to say that uh, the economy operates by extracting this natural resource. This natural resource can grow back at some rate and you can deplete the resource if you extract it too quickly. So it operates like a forest, and everything from the economy is built upon this resource. So this resource gets extracted, and there are four main flows uh, for which this resource is used. And I will describe each of those. So one is there is a, an extraction sector in the economy, and there is a set of capital associated with extracting the resource. So that is the first set of capital. Now this the job of this type of capital, like a set of machines, you could think its job is basically to extract natural resources. So think oil drilling rigs, or you know, this may be a, a good example, or literally extracting things from a forest, also in agriculture. So there's a set of capital associated with extracting natural resources. There's a second set out of two um, types of capital. And the job of this type of capital is to make more capital. So I'm calling it the good sector for capital goods, but this capital basically makes more machines. So this is like manufacturing. So these are machines that make machines. 
So these are the two basic ideas and sectors of the model. So the two flows, I'll just go back here. So there are resources to operate these capital goods or these, these pieces of capital, which is to say all machines require fuel to operate or all machines require energy to operate. So that's that basic physical requirement embedded into this macroeconomic framework. Then there are resources associated that are embodied in capital here. And embodied in capital means that there's an investment decision on the economic side, how much new capital do I want to make? And every time you invest, say $1 or one euro in capital, there is an associated physical quantity of material um, that is embedded in that capital. So you need physical resources to make physical capital. That's rather straightforward. And the fourth out of four flows that are used is that there are resources consumed by essentially people or households um, for human consumption. So at a basic level, this is like a food intake that is required for people to stay alive. And so this consumption of resources feeds back into uh, death rates to regulate population. So there's an investment decision. I'll describe that later. Um, on the right-hand side, all of the units are in money. So let's just say dollars or euros. On the left-hand side, all the flows are in units of resource per time, resources. And in the middle, the blue arrows, the units of tracking in the model are goods, are pieces of capital, like physical pieces of capital. Um, and these get translated into prices, as I'll describe later. Uh, again, the capital goods sector makes capital goods. And whatever capital goods are not necessary for making new investment is left over for consumption by households. So in this model, basically, the economy operates, investment decisions are made, and any kinds of output, resources or capital are left over for people uh, to consume. So the important model feedbacks here are that death rates increase with low household resources consumption. So this is a feedback on uh, population growth related to physical resources. Second, as resources are depleted, extraction capital requires more resource consumption to extract the marginal resource. This just basically means you need more fuel to drill deeper uh, into the ground, for example. I'll explain how that works. And the third one, capital investment requires physical resource consumption, which is to say resources are embodied in capital. So all of these, so the idea here is to link physical flows associated with monetary decisions. So these are uh, kind of a fairly standard approach here in post-Keynesian uh, literature for uh, capital and debt. So K is here, the rate of change of capital is a physical quantity of capital, and it's just in how much did you invest in a physical quantity minus the depreciation of that um, capital. But uh, here's the addition of debt on the bottom. So the rate of change of debt is how much money you invested minus your profits, which essentially the model is saying, if I wanted to invest $100, but I only have $50 in profits, I'm going to take out $50 in debt as a loan from a bank. And then this will induce interest payments uh, from an interest rate on that debt. So this tracks private debt essentially as a loan to the uh, productive sector uh, from uh, a private bank. So uh, the gross output or the output of each sector is a Leontief uh, production function. This production can be limited by the quantity of capital. It can be limited by the quantity of labor, or it can be limited by whether there's enough natural resources input as fuel to operate all of the existing capital. So again, there's a good sector. The CU here is a capital capacity utilization. So if there is any restriction on output at an, any time, uh, the capacity utilization is what adjusts downward to uh, maintain the physical flow balance of resource flows in the economy. So this is just capital divided by a capital output labor ratio that I, or a capital output ratio that I assume is constant. Uh, the extraction sector, um, the output of the extraction sector is, again, capital times its capital utilization, which is K and CU on the right. Um, but then there is Y. Y is the quantity of resources. So what this is basically saying is if the resources available in the environment, say your forests are zero, you are obviously can't extract any more resources. So if Y is zero and you depleted everything, then the economy is essentially done at that point. Uh, and then this delta Y is uh, just a technological parameter that one can play with. So this is how we equate the quantity of labor L on the right side of these equalities. And then A is a 
uh, labor productivity, which is constant in everything I will show you going forward. It doesn't, it's not assumed to change. So here is part of this uh, approach uh, of the macroeconomic modeling is that investment is a decision based upon how much profit share there is. Um, and so this investment function in the middle um, is a, this, these kappa parameters times depreciation. So I, I, I'll show you results where kappa zero is one, meaning investment is always trying to cover depreciation. And then if there are profits, then there is some investment in addition that is based upon how much profit share there is. So uh, I will show results where the, this factor is 1.5, meaning if you have profits of $10, um, you would invest $15 in new capital based upon this particular parameter. So this is what in, uh, induces uh, debt accumulation in the economy. And these are informed by the data for the United States, for example, that show you know historically there is 50% more, say, uh, investment relative to profits for companies. Uh, the wages are a sort of modified uh, Phillips curve idea here, which is the function on the right, which is to say that there are some, you assume some targeted rate of employment, say 60%. And if employment's a little bit higher than 60%, then wages will increase according to this function. If wage, if uh, employment's a little bit less than 60%, this lambda not, then wages will decrease a little bit uh, as a feedback. Uh, but I'm also going to play with these other two factors, which are how much do wages increase with inflation, which is the middle term. Um, if W1, this factor is uh, a number one, it would range between zero and one. If it's one, then wages increase exactly with inflation, so that wages always keep up with prices for the two uh, outputs of the economy. And then the other term is uh, still relevant, but not quite as influential. It's just uh, how wages change with the rate of change of employment itself. Uh, but the main ones uh, are the first two. And so I'm gonna explore differences uh, with those. All right, so uh, let me try to move on here more quickly. Uh, the resource extraction to operate capital, this is one of the main feedbacks. So ADA is a fuel consumption parameter. Uh, in the numerator at the bottom, and then it's divided by delta y. So what, what this says is these, this technical coefficient has a limit of one just by its definition. So as y depletes, as you deplete the resource y, um, this technical coefficient increases, and this is the feedback to, uh, so eta is fuel to operate capital, and then y resources left in the environment. If this goes to zero or goes small enough, then this will basically create a conservation of flow constraint all resources are being consumed and there is no uh, more way to distribute resources in the economy and this would cause a physical constraint in the economy. So this is the limiting feedback. Uh, we would call this a net energy feedback or energy return on investment feedback. All right, so uh, for purposes of moving on so I can get to the results, um, costs, prices are a markup on costs. So prices are just assumed to say be, you know, 10% more than costs. And I'm going to show results that have differences in the cost definition. And this has implications for interpreting what's going on in the model. So if we're going to have full costs, there's depreciation, there's interest payments on debt, there is labor, and there are the intermediate purchases of goods and services within the economy. So this is the full cost assumption, but I also have a marginal cost assumption, which a lot of people use. Uh, which neglects interest payments and depreciation. Uh, so this assumes that firms cannot pass on these costs to their consumers. All right, so uh, the causal effects in the model are first, sectors invest in new capital. Second, I calculate how much labor is required. Third, to determine if labor or capital is limiting an output and adjust capacity utilization and solve for other macroeconomic factors. And, and, uh, and then fourth, um, consumption in households is whatever in this model, I'm just assuming, is left over after investment, which is to say this macroeconomic accounting relationship at the bottom, uh, Y net output minus total investment minus the change in inventories equals consumption. So there's no government in this model yet. All right. So I'm varying costs and prices in the model, and I'm also um, changing uh, capital efficiency of operating which is to say I'm changing the fuel efficiency of capital and I'm exploring these two differences in the model. All right, so here's some basic uh, results from the model. On the left, 
um, you'll have the available natural resource that's in, in the world to extract. And I'm showing both this full cost result and this marginal cost result on the same page. So every one of these plots has four lines. The black solid line is the full cost model, assuming there is no efficiency change in operating capital. The gray solid line is the full cost model, assuming that there, there is a change in fuel efficiency. So if there's a change in fuel efficiency, you can extract more resources than you could before. Uh, if you look at the capital line and go from the solid black line to the solid gray line, again, if you for the full cost model, if you increase the cap, uh, operating efficiency of capital, you increase the amount of capital you can therefore invest in because resources are now don't have to be used for consuming uh, or for operating capital. They can be now used for making new capital. And you can see that on the right with the higher rate of investment. The marginal cost solution has a little bit of a different dynamic with the same basic um, uh, concept of increasing efficiency allows more depletion and more accumulation of capital. This is an expected result. And we can see this similar types of results here in population on the right and net output or GDP in the middle of the chart as well. It looks pretty much like capital accumulation. Uh, population looks also pretty similar on the right, which is to say if I get more efficient in operating um, machines, then there is resources that are available to go to households. And again, since resources available in households affect uh, death rates, then you can accumulate a higher population because there's uh, more resources available in the population. So let's take a me metabolic view of the economy, which is to say, what is the sort of metabolism of the economy? How, do, how can we view the energy consumption of the economy related to its size? And on the right, on the left here, I'm showing data from uh, the world data. So each dot in this chart is a data point for the year 1900 to, to 2018 for the world economy. And this chart is showing the growth rate of primary energy, which is say how fast is primary energy consumption increasing on the y-axis. And on the x-axis is the growth rate of gross world product or global GDP. How much, how fast is GDP growing? And the black line here is me uh, just highlighting some averages uh, for every set of 12 years, because it uh, looks uh, relatively discernible when you do that, in that there is a, a pattern here um, that is gonna, going in a kind of a clockwise pattern. Uh, the black line is a one-to-one is a -one ratio, meaning that from basically the 19 teens until the 19, early 1970s, uh, a one, you know, every increase in primary energy consumption was associated with an equivalent increase rate of gross world product. After the 1970s, uh, it's closer to this two to three ratio. We call this declining energy intensity. And the world economy has experienced about, for every two units of primary energy increase, or for a 2% primary energy increase, there's been a 3% GDP increase. And so most people associate this with decisions to become more efficient and these kinds of things that I'm going to show um, how this is maybe not quite the full interpretation. So the gray area represents an economy that would be in a state of relative decoupling. People would call this relative decoupling uh, because GDP is increasing faster than energy consumption. Uh, from a physical standpoint, we can ask if GDP increases, uh, can increase with physical consumption actually decreasing, or that would be absolute consumption. So on the right here is my equivalent chart of uh, from the Harmony model, from the results I've already showed. And the takeaway here, one of the takeaways here is that they both show this sort of clockwise um, uh, movement here, which is to say you start somewhat near a linear growth regime, as we would say, or near this one-to-one -one line or slightly above this one-to-one -one slope on this graph where energy consumption might increase equal to or faster than GDP. But then at some point, growth cannot increase uh, cannot continue increasingly going faster, which would be why you do not go continually up and to the right. And there was a constraint on natural resources in the model, which forces it basically to come back down into the left. So I'm claiming that if you coherently integrate physical uh, resources and sort of monetary accounting in a macroeconomic framework, this is the pattern you would expect, even with or without efficiency, right? So the black solid line and the black dashed line are results from my model on the right that have no efficiency assumption uh, increase in them in terms of operating capital, that they all show this tendency to go to this uh, relative decoupled state. 
So this implies that it's not a choice to become a decoupled economy or a relative decoupled economy. It's an expectation. It's an expected uh, part of the pattern of a growing economy that reaches, in some sense, its limits to growth, where it cannot grow uh, increasingly fast and it has to restructure itself. Uh, so I'll just try to wrap up here on this on the slide. So we can look at a couple of things. One, uh, more, more decoupling does in fact occur due to increasing resource efficiency. So if I go from the black solid line to the gray solid line for the full cost scenarios, it is more decoupled, meaning it is further away from this one-to-one -one line. Same thing for the marginal cost solutions, the dashed black line to the dashed gray line. Uh, it also increasingly far from the one-to-one -one line. So this is the general story that increasing resource efficiency makes the company, uh, economy more decoupled. But I'm also going to highlight that if you just assume that your economy operates on marginal costs instead of full costs, it also appears more decoupled. So that is to say, if you move from the black solid line to the black dash line, this is the case where I just moved from full cost accounting to marginal cost pricing with no efficiency. The gray solid to the gray dash line is the same for marginal cost if I move from uh, or sorry, if I move from full cost um, modeling with efficiency to marginal cost modeling with efficiency, I go from the gray solid to the gray dash. So this is an additional part of the story. And one part of that story is that there's more debt associated with these marginal cost models. The marginal cost models look more decoupled in the modeling and they also accumulate more debt. So this is this link back to debt that says, well, maybe a more decoupled economy in terms of its material consumption is actually just an economy that's accumulated more financial debt. So this is how we can start to link these ideas of the physical part of the economy to the monetary part of the economy. <clears throat> and because I think I'm basically near or at time, I think I'll stop there and uh, just go to the end. I'll, I'll not present these results, uh, but see if there's any questions uh, from here. Uh, I don't think we can hear you, the moderator. Yes, uh, I was in mode mute. So thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Uh, very, very rich presentation. So if um, there is someone who, who wants to uh, to ask a question, give comments. Yeah, if there's no questions here, I can go back to some slides that I didn't yeah. finish in the normal time. Yeah, uh, okay, uh, we can do it uh, later if you want. I, I have um, uh, some general uh, short question. Uh, maybe let's uh, let's call them uh, uh, an upstream question. Uh, first, uh, first one is about uh, your general assumption. You have a model which combine, uh, let's say, uh, two different uh, logical model, um, physical and economy. And as I know, uh, each uh, model have its own um, specificity, let's say in terms of uh, variable parameters, uh, necessary one. And how did you deal with the risk of being um, obliged to ignore some variables from uh, each kind of model and to guarantee the robustness of the result? if you experiment this kind of difficulty or not? Um, yeah, if I understand your question, you're asking about yeah, how do you know what to include and what to not include in the model? Um, my, you know, at least for the first publication of the model and what I presented here is, 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 is the same with some a little bit fewer different rules. The goal was, I, my goal was to make the simplest model I could that could represent physical feedbacks and represent the idea of how money in the modern economy can be created by banks lending money to companies. Mm -hmm. And so that was basically it. It was like, well, how simple can I make it? And I tried to have as few variables as possible, essentially, um, for that model. It turns out it's not really that few. It's maybe more variables and more equations than someone would want. Um, and I was accused of that by others of saying, well, why did you make it so complicated? And then somebody else might say, it's not that complicated. So it's, I would say it's some medium version of, of, of complication at this point in integration, but I think it's maybe also required um, to, 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 to blend the, the physical modeling side to actually have different units of, of, of flows in the model, right? Like a, a, a flow of energy is power and a flow of money, like in represented as GDP, 
uh, to, to actually coherently link these together was, was the goal. There's probably nine, I think there's eight or nine core differential equations, but then there's a lot of macroeconomic accounting associated with that. So uh, I would say if anybody's familiar with macroeconomic accounting, it's probably easier to pick this up, but the simulation methods and the, uh, might not be as familiar to most economists. They'll be more familiar to physical scientists and engineers who do dynamic system modeling as a more regular basis. So, um, uh, so to answer your question, I dealt with it by trying to make it as simple as I could. And it took longer than I thought. It's normal, maybe. And I included more things than I thought I had to. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Second question, uh, which is also related to the first one. Uh, for me, as I am working on uh, more particularly on the different uh, resources and the different type of resources. So my question is about your model. Uh, I see that you you, you integrate uh, mainly the cost of, of resources. And if, is it possible to, is, it, it is, um, is the model has the flexibility to also look at the type of the resources? And this could maybe maybe uh, give some different result or some uh, so the, the, this the okay. to well, uh, about the type of resource if this could be uh, integrated right. yeah yeah so that is a goal that's what i'm currently working on so right now it's just a forest like resource but the goal is to have a fossil like resource or minerals but maybe hydrocarbons in general and then also have per your areas um, renewable energy technologies that are more akin to wind and solar so these all have these three categories all have fundamental different characteristics. Um, the fossil resource, in the sense that they're not regenerative. Um, the currently the forest-like resource is is a flow, but it can regenerate itself on a time scale. But then the sort of wind and solar-like resources mm -hmm. are flows that we're extracting from the environment. So you require capital investment, and it takes up space somewhere in some land to extract those flows. So that's a different characteristic than the others. And so, yes, this, I'm now in integrating this framework to have a model that has all three of those basic categories or types of resources. And the real difference in this kind of approach, or one of the differences between maybe normal economic approaches, I'm not assuming the cost. You're sort of defining the physical nature of the resource. And then from the accounting principles of how macroeconomics works, the cost comes out of that. Mm -hmm. So you're defining the physical characteristics of the world, and then the cost is derived Exactly. Um, from other economic assumptions and physical assumptions, like the cost would be associated with how you choose to pay people wages, for example, in interest payments. Uh, but there's not an assumed cost of extraction, say. There's a description of the physical world and then how much labor it requires, and then the cost comes out of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Monetary cost. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Is there any comments? Yeah, for anyone? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry. Uh, it, it was just quick. Yeah, in fact, my my remark was about um, about labor costs and uh, uh, and also the skill levels involved. Uh, I guess right now you treat it relatively homogeneously, and you don't assume that they vary, right? So uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody uh, is can magically move from one sector to the other and has all the necessary skills required yeah. at any time. So there's no restriction on that at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I guess it would be useful, but uh, yeah, I guess taking that into, into account would involve adding more variables, which might not necessarily yeah. simplify your job, but yeah. Yeah, no, that's something like that is a, you know, an important consideration in the real world, right? You got this model. And again, my goal was to blend the physical and the monetary side together. And then now I can try to think about these other questions after, in some sense, solving that conundrum of how to blend them. Um, and for anybody who's interested, yeah, I had a book come out last year that describes the similarities and the rationale for modeling the economy much more as a physical uh, quantity or as a physical concept, as opposed to only thinking about flows of money, but blending these ideas together. Thank you. So it's okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, to, to thank you. So we can uh, now pass to the second uh, presentation. So our speaker now is uh, Swarup uh, Rao. Uh, excuse me if I, if I pronounce it uh, not correctly your name. That's my, name all, my, my name too is very difficult to pronounce <laughs> outside the France, so I know. Uh, so uh, trade-off between green growth and uh, pro -po uh, poor growth in Brazil. So uh, it looked to be very, very interesting. So uh, you have uh, the floor.
Great, thank you, uh, thank you, Heiko. I see you're you're from Grenoble as well, so uh, yeah. so yeah, I see it's your background. Well, yeah, okay, we, we, oh. We're from Grenoble School of Management. Uh, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I'm by, uh, yeah, also also in the mountains in uh, in, yeah. in, in <laughs> South Wales. So yeah, we're not very far away. And I, I see uh, Stefan is from uh, Hochschule of Hodsheim as well. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm uh, I'm originally from uh, from the region as well, from from Karlsruhe. So mm -hmm. it feels like it feels like home uh, being here. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, thank you, thank you, Heiko. I will. Um, I'm going to activate my pointer. Okay, the great work stuff. Okay, hi. Uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, for, for being here. So uh, today I'm going to present my paper, which is about um, which is about green growth and pro poor growth uh, in a Brazilian context. Uh, just for some background, I'm I'm a uh, I'm a PhD student. I'm currently in my fourth year, so close uh, to the end. I hope um, I'm also an engineer by training. And then I've uh, I took a step to the dark side, as they say, uh, uh, um, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, right. So uh, we already do have an article. So um, uh, uh, an article co-authored with one of my thesis directors, uh, David Grover, uh, where, where we looked at inequality, uh, income inequality, and unemployment and poverty impacts of uh, certain investments in climate mitigation or emissions mitigation uh, policies. So we looked at the CDM in Brazil. Uh, we uh, came up with some policy recommendations on on what could be done to uh, what can be done to maintain the dual goal of uh, emissions reduction and also or to reduction. Uh, this uh, this appeared in in the in, in climate policy uh, sometime last year. So what we found, which is also broadly relevant to what I'm going to present today, is that uh, investment in in labor-intensive sectors of uh, of the economy uh, were more 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 likely to create reductions in inequality than uh, investment in uh, in, sec in sectors that weren't labor-intensive. And why is this relevant to to energy or renewable energy? Uh, it's because there are different types of energy projects and investment in each type might create uh, different outcomes or different socioeconomic impacts. So that's where uh, we're coming from in general. Uh, so why, why do we care about this? Uh, why, do, uh, why, should, uh, why should you get out of your bed in the morning to, to read this? Uh, it's because both green growth and proof poor growth, or growth that reduces poverty, uh, both are generally seen as essential components of sustainable development, especially with the uh, UN uh, United Nations uh, United Nations Sustainable uh, Development Goals, um, where both of them are mentioned in some way or the other multiple times. Um, and green growth in particular has uh, found a lot of popularity with, with many uh, elected officials, uh, especially especially here in the West, in, in France, uh, uh, because it's trying to, uh, or it's attempting to reach two objectives at once, have economic growth, uh, but also try and, uh, save the environment at the same time. Um, and in the context of developing economies, uh, this, this becomes growth is all the more important uh, because it might have poverty reducing effects. Uh, the relationship between these two, however, is uh, it's, it's not obvious. Uh, while there might be a reason to believe that 
uh, growth which reduces poverty is also good for the environment. Uh, uh, this link isn't isn't always obvious. And just just to complete this, uh, it, it doesn't help that green growth is not not very well defined, uh, and it's in it's sort of a vague term. So we're going to briefly discuss that. Uh, but before we go there, so the main research question for uh, for for this article is to see what socioeconomic impacts do green energy projects in Brazil have on the per capita GDP and employment, and how do they compare to brown energy projects, which are fossil energy products? So, so here uh, we are limiting uh, uh, our our scope to energy projects. Uh, specifically, uh, and try and not get into the whole bigger debate of what exactly is a green job and what exactly is. Um, and and uh, and as I mentioned, not all growth is created equal. Uh, growth in different sectors of the economy, for example, uh, growth in the agricultural sector, the primary sector might have a different socioeconomic outcome than uh, growth in the industry or the manufacturing or uh, in the services sector. Uh, one thing that uh, that we know from the literature is that we are not completely sure uh, which uh, or investment in which sector of the economy creates better socioeconomic outcomes. Uh, there have been a ton of studies, uh, uh, especially by by by, by Martin Ravallion, um, and by my reading of the literature, it's not conclusive. I mean, you have one set of uh, one bunch of results from India, and you have a um, bunch of other results from Brazil, and and a bunch of other stuff from other countries, and it seems to be quite country specific or specific to the stage of development that the country finds itself in. Uh, so it, it, it's all the more reason for, for us to do this analysis in order to find out what the situation is in Brazil. Uh, a very quick um, uh, uh, parenthesis uh, on green jobs. Uh, and their relationship to employment generation or destruction. Uh, this is a highly rhetoric, rhetorical subject. Um, uh, we see this especially in, um, in France uh, and in Germany. Uh, we don't know whether investing in renewable energy uh, or clean energy creates jobs or uh, leads to job destruction and uh, it doesn't help that there's a lot of political rhetoric around um, but it, in general there are a bunch of studies which show that this is green jobs are good for the for uh, job creation some say that they they require uh, more skilled labor um, which might my, which might uh, imply that uh, sectors of the economy or sector, sectors of the job uh, or of the employment pool, which are less skilled, might find themselves out of jobs. And uh, intuitively, it, it, it sort of makes sense. Uh, uh, you create a, a lot of high tech jobs. Um, you, you find a lot of coal miners out of work, I suppose. Uh, so that's the intuition behind it, and this is what we're trying to uh, test empirically here. And to test this empirically, we looked at some investments uh, of, the Brazil, of the Brazilian National Bank, National Development Bank, uh, which, is, uh, which is a huge player in Brazil uh, in terms of investment in projects. Uh, re regularly invests uh, huge amounts of money uh, uh, in the Brazilian economy. Uh, so 
yeah, uh, as high as 4%, 4.7% of uh, the whole Brazilian GDP. And uh, uh, that was in 2009. Um, in general, when we look at all the projects of uh, DB and DES, uh, uh, they're supposed to be a, a development bank, which they are. So, and we've seen that they do have positive social or socioeconomic impact. So they their projects do reduce poverty and uh, induce employment creation. Uh, but where we do not have any literature is in looking at the impacts of uh, the bank's projects uh, separated by investment types or project types. And uh, this uh, uh, the outcome of this study could, could be useful to national development banks in general, and specifically in the Brazilian case, to try and find out or to help the bank get their uh, priorities straight. So that is one of the uh, larger motivations for that, because we're, we're, we're trying to uh, put this as a, a policy related paper. And some words about poverty in Brazil. So in this particular paper, we're looking at absolute poverty, uh, which, uh, which generally can be defined as uh, poverty or, um, or levels of income lower than a, than a fixed poverty line. Um, and the, this has, we're not specifically talking about uh, relative income inequality, just something measured by the Gini index or, or Thailand index or uh, another entropy index, but here just looking at absolute poverty. Um, and absolute poverty in Brazil has been in decline since 2002, which, uh, which is right about the time where our study begins. Uh, and this is generally uh, credited to programs like uh, like Boats of Amelia, which is a uh, social uh, welfare program. It includes direct transfers um, um, and a bunch of other pro smaller programs as well, like uh, you might have heard of Luz Pro Todos, a rural electrification program. Uh, but Boats of Amelia is one of the uh, bigger programs. Uh, and uh, 2003 is also important in Brazilian politics, because that, uh, 2004 rather, uh, that was when um, the, uh, the firebrand uh, president, uh, uh, Lula, was you know, when he came into power. So there are many things attributed to Lula's government, uh, uh, and there are many who ascribe uh, Brazil's economic uh, uh, up upturn to Lula, although I'm not really getting into the politics of this. Uh, again, the impacts of energy related projects are not well studied in the literature. Um, so the way we uh, set up our empirics, uh, or we, the way we set up our, anal uh, our, our analysis, uh, we use um, standard econometric methods uh, to analyze the cause and effects of uh, BNDES, so uh, it's the bank, uh, their energy project investments on uh, GDP per capita and on employment. So here we're using GDP per capita as a proxy for uh, for, 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 for income, for income, uh, income levels, uh, which in turn uh, has an effect on poverty levels uh, in general. Uh, we have uh, project level data from 2003 to 2017, broken down into municipality level, uh, it, which is a very uh, detailed uh, unit of analysis, let's say, so which allows us to get in really into the detail, not just limit our discussion to, uh, to, to broader uh, federal states or broader regions. Uh, and we have census data and the labor survey data, which we, uh, which we put into the panel, uh, and then we run a, a panel uh, analysis. Uh, 
So before we get into the analysis, just some uh, quick descriptive statistics. So just to give, uh, give an idea of the scale of the projects. So the total investment there, there are um, 11,400 projects uh, in total with a mean investment of 34 million Brazilian uh, reais. So uh, one US dollar is uh, roughly equal to 2.5 Brazilian reais, let's say. Right now the exchange rate is, is a bit different, but uh, if you average it out, it's, it's about 2.5. So even if you convert it, convert it into US dollars, it's, it's still, there are still huge projects. So a mean of 34 um, million triage uh, and, a, and a maximum of uh, 9 billion uh, triage, which is a huge project. Uh, there, there are many uh, huge hydroelectric dams or hydroelectric um, generation projects which were funded uh, through this bank. Uh, so, and of course, Brazil is known for its uh, large hydroelectric projects. And you can see the totals here as well. And they break down by the type of investment uh, by energy, uh, including fossil energy and, uh, and uh, decarbonized energy uh, or renewable energy, let's say. And we see that comparatively, of course, fossil energy has uh, received lesser investment than uh, renewable energy, which is which is quite normal, at least in the uh, Brazilian context, because there's not a lot of fossil energy uh, in, in Brazil. Almost very little coal, and it's it's mostly uh, gas and, and, and some uh, uh, petroleum related uh, projects as well. And uh, when we look, when we put all of these into panel, into the panel, and uh, um, and basically do some uh, uh, data cleaning, and uh, we collapse all the data to a municipality level data, uh, which by which we get uh, five thousand five hundred sixty municipalities for fifteen years. So in the, we end up with around 84,000 uh, observations. Uh, and yeah, and the, these two are our main variables of interest, uh, GDP per capita and the total number of people employed. Uh, and these are a, uh, let's say a list of um, covariates that we use. Not going to go through everything in this, uh, uh, but basically we take into account the the investment, the amount of investment, and in, in that goes into each municipality, uh, divided by by different uh, uh, types of investment, and we also take into consideration the GDP share of the primary, secondary, and tertiary sectors, uh, and we. We, and we keep them as covariates in the in the regression, so that uh, we try to control for it as much as possible. Um, uh, we, we we use a bunch of controls. I'm going to explain some of them later as well. And, and of course, um, try and take into account the the effect of population and social welfare transfers to make sure that we're capturing the real effects and we're not capturing uh, other effects that can be that can be attributed to agglomer agglomeration effects, for, uh, for, instance, uh, for example. Uh, yes, yeah, so some more graphs, uh, which pretty much show the main for the same thing. I'm not going to dwell too much on it. So the, the mean investment, the, this is a log scale, more for representation purposes. I can't really... Uh, uh, gathered much from this, uh, but just to show that more or less uh, all all the projects are uh, on the same scale. They're not like a bunch of super tiny projects and a bunch of huge projects. And, and this is like a, something that uh, this the evolution of GDP per capita over time 
uh, it's important to see this because uh, we want to make sure that when we do our regression, we want to really make sure that we're not capturing effects that would already have happened uh, even in the absence of these projects. And uh, uh, this basically shows that while these are parallel lines in some way, uh, it's, it's highly probable that uh, uh, municipalities that have received uh, one project, at least one project, and uh, compared to municipalities without any project, uh, it's, it's highly probable that there's, they would have received, they would have grown in the same at the same rate anyway. So which is what we call an, an, an endogeneity problem or reverse causality, uh, many names for it. So we're gonna treat that uh, just to the next slide, but just to introduce our main model, uh, we use a standard OLS regression with a difference difference estimator um, it's a strongly balanced panel, and we allow for allow for fixed effects. Our main dependent variables are GDP per capita and employment generation, and our main independent variable uh, is the investment in projects distinguished by project type, whether it's energy or non-energy, renewable energy, and fossil energy. And we put in a, uh, a bunch of covariates, which uh, which we, which we think are relevant. So we've talked about the endogeneity problem again. Uh, when we look at the panel, we see that uh, those municipalities which received a project, they, they most likely would have, would have had the same GDP uh, per capita growth, uh, even if they hadn't received the project. So what this means is that it it really messes up our analysis. We wouldn't be able to ascribe the results that we see to the projects themselves. Uh, so we couldn't be we wouldn't be able to say that um, the impact that we see of the projects in our results table, we wouldn't be able to say that this is actually due to the project uh, uh, or actually due to the investment itself. Uh, so we, we can't compare them directly. So what do we do? Um, we, we, use what, we use a propensity score uh, matching method, basically generate a propensity score on how likely uh, uh, a project was likely to be selected in that particular location and try and control for endogeneity uh, based on that. Uh, yeah, we use a, a standard probit model uh, to generate the propensity score. And uh, of course, we, we get our panel divided into uh, different blocks, uh, each block being more or less homogeneous. That means that we can compare uh, uh, the pre treated and non-treated uh, variables in within each block. Uh, and after we do that, then we, we select one of the blocks for analysis with just 48,000 observations, uh, quite, quite large. We see that, well, the endogeneity situation is a bit better, even if not perfect. Uh, so yeah, we we say okay, this is this is probably better, and we can continue with with our regression. Uh, and the way we see that it's better, it's just a visual uh, analysis at the moment, and uh, see that the curves are closer to each other. Let's say uh, we did some robustness checks to to with with some other methods as well, uh, with largely similar results. Uh, come back to those at the end. So uh, what are our main results? So in general, we see that um, projects in general have a positive impact on GDP per capita and also on employment. This is the stable just for GDP per capita. Um, the variables are in, are in logs. So uh, yeah, it, would, it would mean that 
one percent increase in um, in investment per capita all of any project uh, would cause a 0.004 percent increase in gdp per capita and it's highly significant highly statistically significant at uh, at the uh, 0.01 uh, uh, or the uh, the one percent level and when we look at energy and non-energy projects, uh, energy projects seem to have a higher uh, coefficient here uh, as compared to non-energy projects. Uh, and in, in general, this, this seems to be good news, I suppose, for those who are running these projects. Uh, but when we break them down into fossil and renewable energy projects, and we see that Fossil energy projects have uh, a much higher impact than uh, non uh, than renewable energy projects, uh, uh, and there we start to uh, there we start to question why why this is the case, right? Uh, and we'll come to some potential explanations. So for those who are interested, there these are the other covariates. Um, not not going to dwell too much on these. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, uh, completely you're completely welcome. We we throw in a bunch of lags as well, uh, or, and we see that the effects are in general they're persistent for their persistent to time and uh, which which also points to the broader uh, let's say Keynesian effects of uh, of investment. Uh, says uh says that well uh if you invest in something uh, you, uh, you see the we effects are of very, very late if you can have just one minute to uh, to conclude okay great yeah that's uh, towards the end anyways but so yeah so the, the the persistent effects are captured as well and we see uh we see similar results for employment as well uh total employment as dependent variable uh, in fact, we don't even see a statistically significant result for fossil energy uh, for uh, renewable energy projects. Right. Uh, so, a quick summary: um, renewable energy projects have smaller or to reducing and employment risk impacts than fossil energy projects. Uh, what does this mean for the discourse uh, relating to? Uh, to, to green growth and for poor growth uh, it could mean probably that uh, these two things might need to be separated and they might need to be treated differently uh, and not always be confounded and uh, so the, 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 the literally the last slide um, uh, haiku and I'm, I'm nearly done so what we still do not know, uh, have really pinned it down, um, is the, let's say the broad theoretical explanation for this. We, we think that this is due to different skill and labor intensities of different sorts of projects. And we think that uh, uh, fossil energy projects would employ more people uh, in, certain sectors, more most likely the manufacturing sectors, uh, which leads to higher employment creation and uh, GDP per capita increases. And we think that uh, renewable energy projects might not uh, involve the same profile of uh, labor and skill, which, uh, which, which leads to the result that, that we are seeing. Uh, all right, I think I'm unless uh, one of you wants to see a particular slide. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It was very interesting that I forgot to check the time. So we are, we are <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. nine minutes uh, late. So uh, there is someone who has a question. I would have a question. Uh, in fact, a various question. First of all, thank you for the presentation. I think it was very nice. Um, I was just wondering why uh, you chose to focus on Brazil that's where we got uh, the best quality of data let's say mm -hmm. 
and for a longer time period. Okay, and um, then as far as I understood correctly, um, you said that you uh, included only projects from BMPS, right? Yeah. Okay, and I mean, in Brazil, I think there are quite a lot of uh, different projects. Um, yep. Did you just neglect this or uh, I mean, or how did you ensure that you only use this, um, like study the yep. impact that were retrained by this uh, specific uh, project? Yeah, the, 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 that's a good question. So uh, what, we, what we also tried to do is include, um, uh, include one leg of uh, GDP per capita itself to try and account for this fact that there are other, there might be other projects. Uh, and of course, there are a bunch of other investments going in as well, right? So uh, to, in, to really incorporate everything, we, we need to incorporate all investments. And uh, uh, we, we thought it would be better to include one or even two lakhs of, uh, of GDP, per, GDP per capita in order to account for this effect. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, then I have one... Another question, um, what about corruptions? How, I mean, did you include that somehow? I mean, because it's a big issue in Brazil and I think mm -hmm. particularly when you talk about um, projects then it's always a little a question like where does the money actually goes to? I don't know mm -hmm. if I just missed that. Yeah, we don't specifically take that into account. So we kind of treat the data uh, at face value. Yeah, yeah, something to be discussed. I'm not sure how uh, we treat it from the empirical standpoint, but uh, definitely uh, needs to be mentioned and probably I, 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 yeah, definitely I will look at that. Thank you. And also people have mentioned deforestation as well, which is uh, it's also something to be taken into account. Yeah, I would have some more questions, but I will leave the floor also to other people in case they want to ask. Okay, thank you. Maybe I can contact you later. Uh, so yeah, last time, one, one more question, if it's possible. If not, we can pass. I've got one. Um, do you have any breakdown of the types of energy projects that are in your list and the percentage that falls into one category? I know some things about Brazil, and of course, there was a lot of investment in offshore oil, but then the renewables are range from single family farms for like biodiesel yeah. to wind farms. And those are totally different skill levels. So can you speak anything to the different types that were in the data? Mm -hmm. So uh, very quickly, uh, so I do have the answer to your question, not in the slides, but in my, in my data set. Uh, but just to uh, come back to the descriptive stats, uh, we see that, let's say the minimum investment, okay, it's actually a bit misleading. Most of the, most of the projects are, uh, well, they're around the mean investment, so 40 million uh, Brazilian cash uh, with a standard deviation of yeah, 25. So it's they're still large projects. They're not not all of them are, or in fact, the vast majority of, of them are uh, big big uh, solar farm or wind farm uh, projects, and they go up to huge hydroelectric plants. Uh, so those are most definitely the sorts of projects that are being sponsored. Uh, and the, uh, the majority of them were uh, solar and wind. Uh, there are some, some biomass as well, but most of them are solar and wind. Uh, but the bulk of the investment itself goes to the hydroelectric projects, which are of course huge. So yeah, that's a partial, partial answer to your question. Thank you, thank right. you very much. Thank you. So, uh, we have to pass now to the third uh, speaker, uh, Stephen uh, Lewaranz, if it is correctly pronounced, uh, sorry, from Institute of uh, Industrial Ecology, I think in Germany. So he will talk to us about the ecological and economic assessment of the PV uh, technology. So it, it might be very, very interesting. So uh, you have the floor, please. Okay. Thank you for the kind introduction. You pronounced my name perfectly. Uh, I, I hope you can. Do you see the right? I yeah. You see the, yeah. I think you see the presenter mode, or do you see the the right um, presentation? It's presenter uh, mode. It's presenter mode. Okay. Let, let me switch. Sorry. Ah. Just a second.
I think now it's correctly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So thank you for the uh, for the introduction. Yeah, my name is Stefan Liverance from uh, Fordsheim University. I'm working there. At, uh, currently working there, and um, I'm going to talk about um, assessing residential police systems and um, combining economic and uh, ecological assessment to ease decision making. So what is my motivation? So as we already heard today and during the conference, the uh, shift to renewable energy sources is um, important to, um, to stop uh, the climate change. And uh, what we also see is that there is a growing interest of society in climate and environmental protection, for example, by which we see by various um, uh, public foundations like uh, Fridays for Future or like movements, Fridays for, uh, Fridays for Future. And so there is a quite big interest. And uh, But still, we have the magic triangle of energy policy. So we have uh, next to environmental issues. We have system costs and security of supply. But um, I would just focus on uh, system costs and environmental protection just for uh, simplicity in this case. And uh, even if you just uh, go into the detail of environmental protection or environmental impacts, we see that there, there are impacts further than just carbon dioxide emissions. We also have um, land use problems like for uh, utility scale photovoltaic or uh, wind power. Then we have the extraction of minerals and metals, which are basically limited, but also there are side effects. If we um, just mine these uh, over the world, you have like uh, heavy metal uh, emissions, uh, which are just targeting the, the health of um, the people who are working there. And consequently, this is a, so that's, these were just some examples of uh, environmental aspects. Um, so we see that we have a multidimensional problem. So um, we have kind of a, this, a complex decision-making process and um, uh, probably there are different, so there are trade-offs uh, uh, between like uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide emissions and uh, the problem of land. You have uh, available, as I said, for utility scale PV, for example. Uh, but I would just go um, just uh, do this assessment on the example of a rooftop photovoltaic system for a family house. So, and oops, sorry. Um, my research question is kind of that, that um, uh, if I want to install a, a PV system, um, this is quite interesting. If I am interested in uh, protecting the environment, so in saying, uh, saving greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, I would wonder if I want to install it, if it's uh, still um, economic viable, but also um, ecological aspects uh, interesting to do so. And so the problem is to bring economic and ecological aspects together and how to solve this uh, multi criteria decision problem. And uh, probably is this, um, what I want to analyze is, is, is it interesting to do so? So to um, integrate the environmental assessment uh, for the decision making and maybe can it um, even um, drive uh, the expansion of renewable energies. And furthermore, I will will analyze if uh, this combined assessment is usual, us useful for policy or PV module users. So the system I was uh, looking at, or I am looking at is uh, pretty simple. We have like this, this uh, single family home with an electricity consumption of 4,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, I just installed a fixed capacity of three kilowatt peak on the roof and said that we have like uh, 817 kilowatt hour per kilowatt peak um, average yield, um, which is, so the house is located in, in Germany, and um, this is a pretty average yield we can, uh, you can uh, receive there. So we have a module degradation of 2% um, for the first year, then 0.5% the following years. And uh, furthermore, which is interesting is that um, you can only use uh, about 35% of the generated PV electricity for your self-consumption. The rest, so like 65%, uh, you have to export into the electricity grid. So we see on the right-hand side, um, there is a system which I analyzed as a picture and the top, the economic view. So we have, as I said, this exported electricity here, uh, which is credited in Germany with um, a certain amount, which I say, I'll tell you later. And, uh, but still we need to import ele grid electricity. So as a specific price from your electricity provider. So you can uh, just, um, yeah, cover your, your consumption here. 
and for sure you have the the PV investment on a, on a economic uh, economic view. On the other hand side, we have the ecological view. So you still have the PV investment because you have to do some uh, effort to to get this or to produce the modules, the inverters, the cables, and stuff like that. Um, you have to install that, and then um, you can only use 35 percent of the electricity you generate here so i assume every um, kilowatt hour you export gets uh, credit so the assumption is somebody else is going to use the electricity you were producing here but still you need to import um, the, the grid electricity which has an environmental footprint and this is for sure uh, still um, accounted to to my system so i'm doing that by for several or for different um, different PV modules. So um, if we check, uh, for example, the IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency report, we can find different um, PV modules and the total system costs there. Um, so we have here uh, mainstream modules, which are the classic poly or uh, monocrystalline modules with an average um, panel efficiency of 50%. We can have low cost modules, which, which are kind of second hand modules on lo of lower quality. There's a question if you can really reach the full lifetime of the modules, but still, um, I assume they have the same efficiency, but they are just cheaper here. As you see, can see when we look at the total system costs. And um, for example, um, there are also all black modules with the highest uh, efficiency in the classification of IRENA. Uh, followed by a high efficiency crystalline modules with an efficiency of 20% and simple modules, namely uh, CIS, so cadmium, indium, selenium, and uh, cadmium telluride modules, which we should reach a uh, panel efficiency of around about 12%. So with this data, I calculated the levelized cost of electricity uh, with a uh, special uh, discount rate at 2.7%. Lifetime of the modules uh, around 38, uh, no, not around, it's 30 years. Uh, replacement investment after 15 years for the inverters. You get a credit for fed in electricity in the German electricity grid. You have to pay something for operation and maintenance uh, per, per year and kilowatt hours for the photovoltaic module. And um, yeah, as I said, the different investment costs for the different PV modules. And I compared that to the just if I would just take the electricity from the German electricity grid. And uh, for sure, what is uh, important is to say that I just calculated the LCVE for the 35% of um, self-consumption. So the rest is not included here, just with the, uh, with the FED and for the, with the credit, which I told you. About. So on the other hand side, we have for the ecological assessment, uh, we can use uh, a life cycle assessment method which is a methodology um, which is standardized uh, in ESO 14040 or 44, um, which is covering all stages of um, production from um, material, raw material extraction, production use, and disposal of a technology or product. Um, and it, is, it goes beyond uh, just greenhouse gases to climate change. Um, it also includes air pollutants, land use, minerals, and metals, and furthermore. I will show you the results, um, but uh, all these impacts have like a different units, so we can't easily just compare these. So we need to um, normalize these, and therefore we use, um, or I use the method of ecological scarcity, which is uh, basically a special version of a weighted sum. It uses an external normalization uh, based on, in this case for Germany especially, so we normalize all the impacts on the total emissions per year um, in Germany. So for example, total greenhouse gas emissions. And then um, finally you weight this based on political legitimized targets. And then you receive a single score, which is including all the different environmental impacts. And this is measured in eco points. Uh, yeah, basically it's just, uh, the unit which we receive. And all the modeling is done based on the EcoInvent 3.71 uh, database, which is basically a, a life cycle assessment. Uh, so it, it's a, a database for life cycle inventory data, so the material to need to produce the PV systems. So, and finally, I uh, put, uh, use a weighted sum method uh, to, to just put the two criteria together. So we have the total cost, we have the total environmental impact per year. 
and uh, use the uh, vector normalization here, um, R, uh, which is um, X, so the result uh, of the scenario and the two criteria we have, and then um, yeah, normalize this uh, here with the square root. And um, then to, to get the final results, the U, you need the weighting and uh, just Right now, I'm just uh, used the uh, economically and ecologically weighted one to one. So uh, the sum of that is the final result for the impact and uh, cost of for the different PV systems. So if we look at the results, um, we have here on the right hand side um, the scenario. So mainstream low cost of black, as I said. Then we have the Germany electricity mix as a reference scenario which is here like the baseline. And what is interesting is that right now on the, with, the, with the assumptions I've taken is that uh, mainstream modules are like, just gives you a, a saving of 10 USD per year. Uh, whereas you have savings for, which is uh, quite, quite straightforward that low cost modules gives you the highest saving. But um, I think um, here you still have this, uh, the point if you can really reach the, the full lifetime and, um, and also um, the efficiency, uh, the, there could be, you can put a question mark. So um, what I would say is that, yeah, okay, uh, if I would start mainstream, so PV modules, which I can find everywhere on my rooftop, I can say, yeah, okay, I don't, uh, I save like 10 USD, but on the yeah, assumption. So the question is if I really get that. And so I would ask myself, uh, do I really want that? Because I still, other things to do because I have a company then and I have to pay taxes and uh, do uh, much more work. Um, and here it comes to the LCA results where we can see if I'm, um, you see here on the top, uh, the, the, the emissions of an eco points per kilo for the several scenarios. And uh, as you can see here, here we have all the impact indicators which are included in, in this indicator and gray especially is the global warming potential so the co2 emissions and we see that we can reduce these uh, quite strong and um, so we can reduce it by minus uh, 30 eco points but especially here we can see that mainstream and low cost modules are not the best options uh, for example sin film is just a better technology when it comes to environmental impacts because we have um, here, um, lower, lower emissions or lower energy um, demand for the production. And um, so, okay. And there's, there are some uh, contra, counteracting um, impacts. Uh, I will just tell you because it's a bit hard to see because of the colors. Um, we have uh, some more um, heavy metal emissions, which is blue here, quite small. And this is like, um, yeah, 10 times higher um, here. So there are so counteracting effects, not that strong, but not so, so obvious, but still there are, they are there. And um, yeah, and uh, on the bottom here, we see like the, um, that we reduce um, the total impact if we, because I still have to, to import um, uh, electricity mix from the German um, market of electricity. So just like uh, the German electricity mix. And so I, still import quite high um, uh, number of eco points, but they can reduce it like uh, about like, uh, what I say, 60, six, around 60 eco points uh, compared to the German electricity mix, if I uh, look at the uh, complete year. So and if I apply the weighted sum method, then um, I, I uh, produce a different picture um, as we, if I would just take um, the, the, the costs into account. What I can see is that um, I normalized everything to, Z, uh, to one. So we have like one is the worst scenario and um, here is the German electricity mix. So this is no option at all anymore. And um, here we can pretty good see that mainstream and low cost modules are the best alternatives followed by the simple um, modules, which are even um, the most expensive ones, but still um, here it's uh, quite interesting uh, because they are quite uh, good uh, from the environmental perspective. Yeah, so as I already said, uh, low cost modules can be discussed because we probably can't reach lifetime or have other issues with that.
So then uh, I performed the sensitivity analysis for the weighting factors. As I already said, we had uh, I was just weighting uh, both both criteria with one. And um, on the left hand side here, you see um, the 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 economic weight increasing, and I left the ecologic weight uh, constant at one. And on the right hand side, we have the results for the ecological weight um, uh, increasing, and uh, the economic weight is. Uh, Conceptually, one. And uh, here on the right hand side, we see quite interesting that uh, if I uh, increase the weight of the ecological uh, criteria just by 0.1, so from 1 to 1.1, 1 .1, um, we already see that um, the synfilm modules are getting uh, pretty much better, so becoming the best option and uh, they uh, sticking to be the best option. To, which is good. yeah quite clear here as you see if we would increase the weight to two, um, which is quite interesting. So if I just weight uh, the economic perspective a little bit higher, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, quite, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it has a high, high influence on the total, uh, total result. On the left-hand side, if I would uh, keep the, the economic weight, uh, the, sorry, the ecologic weight constant and increase the economic weight, we would see that uh, the German electricity mix here it just um, moves on uh, on the third rank. It's still being the the third best option, so it's just getting a bit better. But still, um, I would stick to low cost modules for sure and uh, mainstream modules yeah, because we already have seen that um, these options are already cheaper than the electricity mix, but just a tiny bit. So my conclusion and implications are that um, the utilization of PV plants is for all uh, PV technologies for sure beneficial, but uh, only low price modules are economic viable or just the mainstream modules as well, just a bit. Um, but I think the attractiveness for installation of PV plants for homeowners should be higher because it's a uh, quite good technology, which is uh, yeah, using uh, so would have a good effect on the uh, environment uh, um, performance. Um, but still, there are PV modules which are uh, which have a better environmental performance than the mainstream modules. So it uh, could be thought about to update the incentive system, so uh, which uh, differentiate, would differentiate between uh, different module types. Or if I uh, would just increase my self consumption for, uh, for sure, because this is also um, environmentally beneficial. Uh, so the integration of electricity, electricity storage systems um, should be included in some incentives or whatever. So um, as we have seen that the, the performing of an assessment for environmental impacts next to the economic uh, assessment increases insights about, for sure, uh, about the, the technology or the energy system I'm looking at and uh, can deliver arguments for or against the uh, different scenarios. and. And it's important to do so because there are counteracting um, environmental impacts, as I just showed you as an example for um, heavy metals. And uh, so we must look uh, to, to yeah, about or consider more environmental impacts just to carbon dioxide emissions. And um, for this method is obviously um, applicable for different energy systems. So um, this can be done with every um, the different uh, energy system I'm looking at. And um, yeah, it could be interesting for policymakers or just the producers of modules because um, it delivers uh, more arguments for, uh, for a module, for example, synfilm, as its uh, impact is lower than uh, mainstream modules, for example. Um, what are the limitations? For sure, there are a lot of limitations. Um, I think uh, security of supply is quite important, uh, which must uh, be integrated. Um, the, the method to define the weights uh, must be looked uh, pretty closely. Um, why this is always a problem? Why why I've, uh, why taking the weights like they are? Um, it's important to extend the assessment on implementing electricity storage systems because it's quite state of the art right now to have those integrated in your PV home PV system. And uh, you could expand that on industrial and commercial buildings. Um, the sensitivity analysis for the economic assessment uh, could be interesting because the discount rate um, is quite important or has an eye impact on the results. Um, um, I was 
all the time talking about three kilowatt peak uh, inst installed uh, capacity um, of PV. This is, uh, uh, yeah, could be discussed what will, would happen if uh, we would increase the capacity because then you have other impacts because uh, the taxation for the uh, produced electricity might change or would change. And uh, finally, for the environmental assessment, uh, still there are, uh, you need better data for the life cycle inventory because right now the different module types are not um, and are not completely integrated in this database. So I just had to change some parameters inside there to um, to receive the results. Yeah, well, that was all. Thank you for your attention, and yeah, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can open the question uh, time. Can I ask yeah. some questions, but I will leave the stage to somebody else first. Then can I, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I'll ask a question. I was going <laughs> to defer as well, but I'll go. Um, so yeah, one, I, I sit here in Austin, Texas, and the homes here consume normally more than three times more electricity than your model home there. Just, it's, you know, big difference. Um, but so that's making me think on this type of analysis and trying to go low carbon. And one of the general ideas is to have more electrification. And Germany, I'm guessing a lot of homes don't have electric heat. So you're talking about ways to um, extend the analysis in one of your concluding slides and storage was one of them. So have you thought about how feasible it is to extend electrification of heating, I guess, in, in, in Germany and how that would affect these kinds of analyses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's quite important because um, we are talking about that. Um, we still, I think uh, most of the heating in Germany is done by natural gas. And um, for sure, we need to substitute that by either electricity or some other renewable energy types like wood, <laughs> like your forest you have. And um, yeah, for, for, yeah, just joking. Um, yeah. That, uh, should be done for sure. Yeah, it's good. Good uh, remark. That. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I was just thinking. Yeah, he heating is the uh, is the huge challenge there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Swaro. No, uh, just just a quick uh, comment to say that uh, Stefan was much quicker than I was. So, uh, uh, good job on that. <laughs> Okay, then I will just shoot if that's okay. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned um, in the economic partner um, operation and maintenance costs. Did you also include that in the life cycle assessment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this, the, yeah, it's included, yeah. And this would look how? Is it just like cleaning in terms of water or how did you Basically, model that? Basically, yeah, yeah, it's just water. Okay. No, so maybe some electricity, I'm not sure. Yeah, but I think it's mostly water. Okay. Um, and then, um, so for the inventories, for the PV panels, you just used the database from the, from Econvent, no? Yeah, I, did. I, used, that yeah I, I used that. And then I, uh, for, for the, um, because you don't have this classification, which is Irina using um, in Econvent. So I just uh, um, kind of created the market for, um, uh, for um, the mainstream modules like that, that there's a mixture of uh, mono and polycrystalline. And for um, their high efficiency, I just went into the background data and changed the efficiency on that. So okay. that you have the high efficiency, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, understand. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but there is a new study of uh, Frischknecht um, reporting uh, updated LCI for uh, different PV types. I can sure. send if you are interested. Oh yeah, I am. Thank you. Um, and then I was wondering when you said the weighting of one to one, I mean, you did a sensitivity, but can't we just somehow derive that from policies? Like, I mean, it's very, very hard and I guess it's super difficult, but yeah. Yeah, um, that's actually the idea um, for, for my further work. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I will not work, especially on the PV modules, but um, for the weighting, I would uh, want to analyze if I can use uh, the weighting system of the 
uh, for the ecological scarcity method to, to just put everything in one metric if I can maybe use also um, yeah, this to, to find a weighting for ecological and uh, economic aspects, yeah. Or maybe if, if you can, you could probably break that down. So you can um, say, um, if I am a homeowner or some electricity um, supplier, or just I, I have my own electricity system, or and then I want to, um, uh, I have like something in mind, I want to reduce the cost, or I just want to stay at the cost I have right now. And then I can use a methodology, which I use for the weighting for, for the eco uh, ecological aspects as well for economic aspects, as I can say, yeah, I want to uh, reach this price at the end. So and then, uh, yeah, or what, I want, my, am I, uh, what are my reduction targets for CO2 emissions as well? Yeah. Very nice, thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. Thanks thank you very much. So we respect the time. It's perfect. So you can uh, thank you very much, Stephen, for your uh, clear uh, presentation and also uh, answers. Uh, we can now pass to, to our um, last uh, presentation. So uh, it's time to give the floor to Marta uh, Maria Pisa uh, for her presentation about the macroeconomics effects of climate shocks in Europe. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. So, uh, thank you so much uh, to being here. I'm Marta Maria Pisa and uh, I'm a first uh, year PhD student uh, at Sapienza University. This is my first uh, uh, presentation, so <laughs> take care about me, I'm joking. And today I present a, a joint work uh, with two researchers uh, of my university, Francesco Simone Lucidi and Massimiliano Tancioni. Our, in our work, uh, we evaluate uh, the effect uh, of the macroeconomic effects of climate shock uh, in the Eurozone. And uh, in particular, uh, we, uh, we are focusing on uh, uh, temperature shock. So uh, firstly, I will give you, uh, I will explain uh, uh, the motivation behind uh, our work, uh, and I will give you some hint uh, about the related literature uh, of this topic. And then I will move on on the model, and in particular, I will focus on the identification structures. And finally, I will discuss with you uh, the results. Uh, so unfortunately, we know that we are in time uh, when, uh, where climate is changing. Uh, in particular, there is an increasing in climate, climatic variability, which is due to global warming. And in particular, with respect to Eurozone's uh, climatic area, uh, since uh, it is an heterogeneous uh, uh, area, uh, the impact of this climate variability is expected to be divergent. So as macroeconomic, uh, an important and relevant question is how this uh, uh, changing in climate can affect uh, uh, macroeconomic dynamic. And in particular, uh, if uh, some policy relevant variables uh, can be involved uh, in these changes. Uh, so to retrieve uh, um, information to, to move on on the analysis, so we, have to, uh, we have to retrieve information from uh, recent historical data. Uh, since uh, uh, in the Eurozone uh, we have a centralized monetary policy which uh, has uh, as a target uh, aggregate uh, uh, inflation, asymmetric shocks uh, uh, actually do matter because can be uh, add, uh, a, a source, can be a, a further source of price uh, dispersion. So it's needed to uh, actually evaluate uh, um, the effect of climate shocks uh, for Eurozone's uh, macro policy relevant target variable, which are uh, in particular prices. 
So uh, our work uh, uh, rely on this, uh, uh, these topics. And uh, what we do, what, what is our contribution? Well, as I said, in particular, we are focused on temperature shocks uh, in the Eurozone. And we want to uh, retrieve uh, nonlinear effects uh, within countries, but also across, uh, across countries. What we do not do in our work, uh, which is important to highlight uh, in terms to better understand uh, uh, our, our contribution, is that we do not uh, um, analyze uh, extreme weather events because we just, uh, um, we just analyze uh, deviation from, uh, um, temperature, uh, of temperature from uh, its historical values. It doesn't matter if they are small or big, just deviation. Uh, a limitation of our work is that we do not take account uh, uh, of uh, weather heterogeneity within countries, and we only uh, work with uh, average data. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, one climatic variable, which is uh, temperature, and in particular uh, is uh, the deviation uh, of average monthly temperature, temperature from uh, its historical uh, average values. And uh, uh, what about macroeconomic variables? We have uh, uh, gross value added uh, of uh, agriculture and energy production, so we choose uh, as transmission channel of, of the shocks, uh, uh, the agricultural and energy sectors. And uh, we have a, a consumer price index of food, uh, of energy, and of uh, all items. And these are uh, actually domestic prices, so are country specific. And finally, we have uh, uh, Eurozone uh, harmonized consumer price index. Uh, the empirical model is uh, as, uh, a structural vector as a regressive model. We implement, uh, uh, we um, um, estimate uh, this model by Bayesian techniques, uh, and the sample period is uh, from 2000, 2001 uh, to uh, 2016 and 12. And uh, uh, so we identify, uh, as I said, a temperature shock. In, uh, in the first part of our work, uh, we, um, we use uh, a an, uh, an, an standard recursive uh, uh, identification. Uh, it's a standard uh, identification strategy in the literature, which is uh, Cholesky decomposition. Uh, the characteristics of this uh, kind of identification is that um, the order uh, when you, the, the first variable in the system is uh, the most exogenous variable. Uh, what it means uh, that uh, uh, within the months, uh, so because we have uh, uh, monthly data, uh, we can say within the months, a shock that. Uh, uh, impact on this variable contemporaneously as affects all the other variables in the model. But a shock that impacts on the other variable in the model do not affect contemporaneously, so within the months, uh, uh, the first uh, variable, for example. So we assume that temperature is the most exogenous variable, so we uh, order this variable as the first variable. This is the impulse response function uh, to cold shock, so to negative deviation of temperature from its historical values in northern countries. For the sake of simplicity for the presentation, I aggregate uh, uh, the, the impulse response function of these uh, countries uh, that you can see at the bottom of the slide. And uh, okay, here we have an exogenous decrease uh, in temperature. We, we see an increase, but just because we reverse uh, the sign. And what we can say uh, from these results, uh, uh, well, the, the impacts on food prices and uh, um, prices of all items, so prices in general, are 
actually quite small because uh, they are, for example, for food prices, 0.005%. And uh, um, of course, it is an increase. And for uh, uh, CPI, it's 0.002%. While for energy prices, it's actually uh, much more stronger. So we have a 0.01% of impact. Uh, but um, what we can say about a hot shock in northern country, what we uh, actually uh, can see from this slide is that the shock is symmetric. And it's obvious because uh, we use Cholesky uh, uh, decomposition, so it's normal. And so uh, here we see an uh, exogenous, uh, actually an exogenous increase in temperature and we see that we have a decrease that is uh, uh, symmetric. So what is the issue? So if we use this kind of identification, uh, we have symmetric and linear response of micro variable for both uh, positive and negative temperature shocks. But we can, uh, we, we are confident uh, on these uh, results. I mean, um, it's, uh, it's um, fair uh, to think that uh, a positive sh uh, temperature shock uh, can have the same impact of a negative one in absolute values. We are not in confident on this uh, on these results uh, because, uh, for example, if you think uh, in a country that uh, already has a, a high temperature, uh, it, it, it's fair to think that uh, an increase, uh, so a much higher temperature, can have a different impact uh, with respect to a decrease. Uh, in, uh, in, in temperature. So we think that uh, weather structure actually matters. So uh, this is a work in progress. So now we are thinking in a new uh, identification strategy and, and we uh, come up uh, with uh, a recursive structure. So uh, we, um, we keep uh, uh, a part of the recursive structure, but we add uh, uh, a sign in the structure. So we, we impose uh, some restrictions. Uh, this is important to us uh, to differentiate uh, uh, between positive and negative temperature shocks in the system. And how we can do that? We have to add uh, one more variable and so we exploit uh, the Gay-Lussac's law, which is a physics uh, uh, law. Um, so we exploit uh, the relationship between pressure and between temperature, which is uh, uh, direct uh, proportional. But we need uh, a variable that moves in the same way, no matter if we have uh, a variability that comes from a negative or a positive uh, uh, deviation of temperature. So actually, we have uh, in the system the variance of the vapor pressure because variance moves uh, uh, always increase uh, no matter what uh, uh, what is the, the variability if it's negative or positive so here we have that um, in the same structure of before so we have the temperature disorder first uh, but we have the, the the new variable actually that is ordered uh, uh, as the second one so now the um, the variance covariance, the, um, the variance covariance matrix of the contemporaneous relationship between variables uh, uh, have this, uh, this, uh, this fashion, this shape. So here we have uh, uh, temperature, and here in the second line we have a variance of, of the vapor pressure. So we impose uh, in the first column we identify a hot shock. So we impose the temperature uh, goes up, so it's a positive sign, and uh, vapor pressure, the variance of the vapor pressure goes up to. Goes up to. In the second column, we identify a, a, neg a negative deviation of temperature. So we impose the temperature goes down and the variance uh, uh, goes up. So uh, here we have the preliminary uh, results of our study. And uh, this is the input response function to a positive and a negative uh, temperature shots. And the, the um, blue lines uh, are uh, the, the, the 
cold shock while the hot the, the red line are the um, lines are the, the hot shock. So now actually we can see uh, some non-linearity in the response of the macro variable. For example, here we can see that uh, uh, the en energy prices uh, in the energy prices we have non-linearity in the responses uh, uh, for positive or ne and negative temperature shocks. And uh, we have also a stronger uh, responses, uh, a more significant uh, response uh, uh, to uh, cold shock. And um, also here, okay, we have symmetries, uh, symmetry, but if you look at the, the magnitude of the effect, we have that uh, the, the effect of a hot shock in Spain has much more impact on energy production with respect to uh, the, the cold one, which is also not significant. Here we have uh, the impulse response function to a positive and negative shocks uh, in Greece. And here uh, the nonlinearity is much more stronger. Uh, so we have, uh, for example, that uh, prices, uh, uh, energy and food prices goes up uh, for the two, uh, for both uh, the shocks uh, and the CPI goes down. And also here we have that the impact of uh, a cold shock uh, is actually more uh, significant and more strong uh, and stronger respect to the, to the hot one. Um, the last country that we have is Italy. So uh, also here we have non-linearity and for except uh, uh, of uh, value added of agriculture. And also here we can see that the cold shock has a stronger impact uh, in prices, uh, but also in energy production. Um, so uh, the responses to temperature shocks are generally, generally relevant for macroeconomic. And so the issues actually may be relevant for uh, policymakers. Uh, as as, I, uh, as we just seen, uh, temperature shocks uh, have significantly nonlinear effect for positive and negative deviation of temperature from uh, its historical value. And uh, also we have evidence of significant heterogeneity within the country with respect to the two different shocks, but also uh, we have uh, different, different responses uh, in, in the country. So we have also cross-country heterogeneity. And uh, this can be due uh, to the uh, different weather uh, structure of the countries, but also uh, to the, the maybe to the different transmission channels of the shocks in the different country. And this is something in which we uh, would like to focus more in, in further research. Um, so any, any advices on this are more than welcome. Um, so uh, this is for sure uh, an, an additional source uh, of heterogeneity for uh, uh, Eurozone country. And uh, an important question also is uh, if uh, actually the central bank uh, uh, has to target uh, this kind of variation in inflation that are triggered by uh, climate shocks. Uh, so. In particular, in further research, uh, uh, we would like to, to focus uh, also uh, on uh, extreme climate events, uh, since uh, the Eurozone uh, um, is expected to be hit more and more, and for sure uh, the frequency of the adverse uh, extreme climatic events uh, will hit uh, this area, uh, it will increase uh, the, the frequency of these events. Uh and uh, also on the long term uh, uh, change and as i said before on uh, um, on transmission channels so uh, to identify the, the 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 optimal or the right transmission channels uh, for uh, the different country uh, of this kind of shock so uh, i think uh, i'm in time thank you for your attention thank you very much Marta. Uh, very, very clear.
Interesting. Uh, so we, if there is a questions. I'll ask one uh, yeah. question. I, th I think in your conclusions, I think you had identified one of the good challenges and useful areas for this research, which is to link it to longer term change. So uh, good luck there and uh, hopefully you come up with some good results. Um, uh, my question is, could you perhaps re-explain the justification or reasoning for using the variation in vapor pressure just to get a nonlinear effect in the effect of positive or negative? I didn't quite follow why we would know this is a good thing to do. So the, the justification uh, about the identification structure or why we use uh, properly the, vari the variance of the vapor pressure? Uh, yeah, the variance of vapor pressure. Like, do we imagine it relates to rainfall and thus hydroelectric production or something or food production? I, I'm trying to think about the physical impact. Uh, no, we, we just uh, uh, choose uh, the variance uh, of vapor pressure um, because we rely on, on, the, on the, the physics uh, relationship uh, between uh, pressure, so the vapor pressure and uh, the temperature. So we know that uh, when uh, the vapor temperature increases, uh, temperature also increases and vice, vice versa. So since the variance uh, uh, is always a, a positive, um, uh, a positive um, by definition, a positive, uh, as I said, uh, entity, um, we, we can say actually that uh, no matter what, uh, no, no matter if we have uh, a variation uh, of the temperature that, that, are, that is, uh, uh, positive or negative. We, we, are, we just have a deviation, a variability of the, of the um, temperature. And for that, vi the variance of the pressure always increase. I don't know if... Uh... All right, I guess I was thinking, I mean, you could take any variable and take its deviation and square it and you would have something that is positive all the time and no, maybe yeah. gives you the same nonlinear effect. So I was just kind of... Yeah, we choose, uh, we choose the vapor pressure because we are sure that there is this kind of relation for, from the, the, the physics. Mm -hmm. I, I could ask another question for, for your... Yeah. Your, your conclusion on trying to think about longer term influence of temperature change and, and, and climate, um, you know, sort of the, some, you know, well, some well known economists like Richard Toll and William Nordhaus say from their modeling that something like a four degrees temperature rise might be optimal because we still have a higher GDP according to their modeling assumptions. And if it gets hot in places, most of GDP comes from people doing things indoors and will just air condition. Uh, more spaces, and it seems kind of like an implausible rationale to me. So, um, I don't. How how have you have you thought at all? I mean, how have you thought about trying to link short term changes in temperature and then economic impacts to longer term changes over decades and an average temperature? No, uh, okay. No, so you mean that in the short term, uh, the theory is that. Uh, uh, higher temperature uh, do not impact negatively on uh, GDP, right? But in the long term, uh, it, uh, it would, uh, in this sense, uh, if I understand that. Uh, yes, a little bit. So yeah, I mean, if you think you're using monthly data and if there's a, a heat wave and a temperature rise, then you might think you've got low hydropower and there's more electricity consumption and agriculture suffered, uh, but maybe only for one year or something like this. Um, for climate change, you wonder how to think about that. Does it happen every year or is it a constant yeah. decline? Yeah, so I, I just, I, I don't know how, I, just wondering how much you've thought about that so far. You said it was your future work, so it's yeah, okay. Yeah. But. No, actually, actually we, we have to, we have to think about that, but we do not have to uh, think about that, that now. But it's something that we know that is important uh, 
and uh, it is the analysis also in the long term change uh, uh, can help to have uh, a more clear and detailed and complete uh, uh, analysis on the topic. So for sure we will we will um, go further in this uh, in this way. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have also one question. Um, so uh, based on your preliminary result and also on your abstract, I have seen that you um, suggest that um, uh, your result should be taken into account by uh, politics in general. And I, and I, I guess it is true. Huh? Uh, so my question is, uh, what are you planning to use as a driver to, uh, to, to allow that uh, politics, that uh, financial uh, and financial policy and uh, central banks to take into account uh, this kind of result of uh, uh, how climate shocks uh, are influencing economics? It's very important. If it is true, I think it's very, very important to have a driver that could be used to internalize uh, the, uh, this conclusion, if I can say. Uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, to, to study also the impact on, uh, um, uh, for example, the, um, the impact on uh, the, of, of the uh, Tran transition and, and transaction uh, of the um, on 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 the uh, the investment of the central bank, for example, uh, in green or brown uh, brown assets, and um, I don't know if I understand well the the, the question. But you, you mean uh, drivers uh, in terms of uh, uh, in, including in the model uh, other variables? Uh, yeah. ah, okay, 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 sorry. Um, yes, uh, we, we are uh, thinking about that. Uh, we actually um, don't have, uh, do not have already a, a clear right. idea because it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, so easy to... Um, to, to understand the, the, the how uh, the the central bank, which can be a good variable uh, in this sense, uh, because I mean uh, we we choose prices uh, and uh, the central banks uh, uh, targeting uh, on prices. Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, the first variable of uh, we we thought, but. Okay. Uh, this, uh, we don't have uh, already a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other question? So we still have some minutes. If not, we can. Uh, I think we can. No, maybe, maybe uh, we um, will. We will uh, rely on uh, on theory for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Okay. Okay, so thank you uh, very much for all speakers, the participants. It was very interactive and it was very, very um, interesting for all of us. So I have just to, to say to you, uh, good luck for the, for the future. Okay, Dominic has uh, last question, maybe. Dominic Hubert. No, it's okay? No, thank you. Fine, I just, maybe. Uh, just thank you. It was thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good work. Okay, thanks and bye. Goodbye.